Hi there, welcome to another edition of Talk Stocks. I'm your host, Keir Reynolds, and today we're lucky enough to have Sean Kuhn, President and CEO of Dolly Varden Silver Corp. Trades under the on the TSX Venture with the ticker DV. Hey Sean, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, Keir. Hey, thank you. You're you're as busy as anybody in the business these days. Traveling, I see you're on lots of uh, doing lots of interviews, lots of content, uh, getting the story out there in a phenomenal way. So I really appreciate you fitting me in. Uh, just for a little backstory, I guess I've been a shareholder of your company for nearly three years, and uh, it's one of those where you know it went from maybe I was going to be interested for a short period of time to hey, it looks like there's a big story here, and I should just sit tight. So, anyways, really impressed with what you guys have going on, and look forward to sort of diving in. But maybe before we get into Dolly specifically, maybe you could tell us a, a little bit about yourself, uh, how you got into the business, uh, maybe where you went to school, how you got started, some of the expertise you, you sort of developed over the last few years and, and who you might have worked with. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, it's funny. Uh, it It's coming up to 20 years um, this coming March, uh, 20 years in the business. And I got to say, I just kind of it was a fluke. I just stumbled into it. I, I was, I didn't grow up around it. I don't have any family members that are in it. Um, and actually when I first heard about, you know, the, this junior mining business here, it was, uh, it was quite foreign to me. So, um, but you know what, there was a, there was a bunch of jargon, uh, you know, things like you know, market cap or trading symbol that, and and honestly, like it, it took a couple of months to to understand some of the concepts around the bid and auction markets. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, I, like I'll tell you, like it is, and I and that's why I try to introduce as many people to it as possible, whether it's my kids or when I see young people, because. I don't think we've done a good job of introducing this. It's almost like a, it's almost like a, a secret society where, you know, and uh, you look at, you look at the mining industry and, and how it used to be to run and governed. And it's, it's like this, this, this old fraternity. And, um, but it's, it's a, such an amazing, um, I've had such an amazing journey. Right. Um, in terms of you know, going all over the world, seeing different projects, going into different money centers. And um, it's uh, it, and every day is an adventure. And uh, further to that, when it comes to the stock market, like every day, you know, you've got economic news, whether it's on the macro level, it could be something that's happened off in China that impacts the price of gold and it makes me want to spring out of bed every morning at 5 a.m. And, and see what's going on. Um, so it's, to me, I have fallen in love. This has become a, such a passion and um, it doesn't feel like work. Hey, that's great. Well, one of the, I, I keep hearing your name mentioned all the time as somebody who is great at being able to raise capital and bring capital to meaningful stories. Uh, maybe you could explain a little bit of why, why your name sort of mentioned in those circles and uh, if you look at Dolly, uh, you guys have a pretty imp impressive shareholder base of some uh, number of corporates. H how did, uh, you know, if you were wondering about, you know, having to learn jargon like market cap, how did you go from that to being kind of uh, an ultimate capital allocator? You know, I, I got to It's funny. I, I really appreciate where I cut my teeth in terms of I grew up in an office of accountants and um, financial experts um, and people that really instilled this idea in me that you need to have a return on your investment. So if you're raising money from shareholders, those shareholders need to see a benefit in the company. And I think about if I had started on a different path or in a different journey, um, I may, you know, returns to shareholders may not be top of mind there may be it may be more about uncovering some scientific questions that don't always deliver those returns and so what i'd really try to do is um through that process you know and, and it all starts with identifying an opportunity that's depressed and i think we we live in in a, in a business where i've seen projects um where 
people will pay you to take them. You know, actually, the, the project that comes to mind is uh, there's a project in the Golden Triangle. It's called Red Mountain. And there was a time where um, Rudy Franck at uh, Seabridge was, uh, was paid to take that project. Because if you look at that project, it was a liability. You know, there was an advance royalty payment of $50,000 that was owed. There was a holding cost. There was, um, you know, so every year there was an overhead. And how long could you maintain that overhead? So Rudy was at a place where the, the, the owners of the project paid him to take it. Okay. Now, fast forward a few years, somebody then buys it from him. And I think the terms were around $5 million. So then this little junior comes along, IDM, and IDM pays Rudy $5 million. So a project that somebody paid him to take, he now is able to sell for $5 million. Fast forward a few more years, and Ascot acquires Red Mountain for $50 million. And that's an, that's a that's a minor example. There's other examples where we can look at like the, the Great Bear example of Dixie, where you know one point eight billion dollars of wealth was created for the Great Bear shareholders in just a few short years. So I don't know another business in the world where you can create that type of wealth for your investors. So I just think that. You know, and and my approach after 20 years has been it's not just about delivering returns for investors. That's very, very important. Right. But how do we do that in a way where, where the stakeholders are winning? Right. Um, you know, you're you're approaching this in a way where it's minimal disturbance and you're just trying to be really thoughtful at every decision. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, if you always just try to focus on shareholders, uh, sometimes your timing can be wrong. And, you know, sometimes there's higher market caps and higher share prices and commod different commodities are in and out of favor. Uh, I guess if you can sort of make sure that you're doing something meaningful with the capital, maybe the rest sort of takes care of itself. Is that sort of is that sort of the approach that you might take? Yeah, that that is 100 percent. But the other part of it is like listening. And like truly listening uh, to the investor and to the market. And a lesson that I learned early in my career was as much as, you know, you're managed by a board and those board are accountable to shareholders, there's an even greater boss and that's Mr. Market. And so really understanding, like, depending on what stage of company you're at, you talk about you know, some of the big numbers of raises, like when they're in it, it's literally in the billions that I've been a part of. And it's about providing a product. And like, I, I've been, I've been talking to a friend who's a, a very good friend. He's an investment banker. And um, he, he threw out this idea of creating must own precious metals equities. And what he meant by that idea is, can you have a company that trades, so there's liquidity. And like we are in a world where liquidity is everything. And if you have liquidity, then whether it's institutional investors or whether it's retail investors, they'll feel comfortable to come in and get behind the idea because regardless of the outcome, regardless of what the metal price is doing or what the project is doing, they feel confident that they can, if they have to leave, if they get faced with a redemption or if they get faced with life they can uh, they have the ability to leave so it's it's understanding and trying to and i'll tell you one of the toughest things to do here and you know this because you're an entrepreneur and you've been working with in, in the venture capital world and, and you've launched companies the launch is one of the most difficult things to do you know and i think about how difficult it was when i started in my career you know not not just about I'm trying to understand the business, but also developing the relationships and the network and understanding how to move something forward. And then over time, instead of me having to go out for business, business then comes to you because business and capital trust. And, uh, and now I'm at a place where deals and money and people 
are showing up on my desk and it's me now asking myself, what does the market want? What will the market support? And, and where can we maximize those opportunities? And so I've tried to pride myself in now monitoring hundreds, if not thousands of opportunities and just monitoring and monitoring and learning from those opportunities. And when some of those get into trouble, um, asking myself if the market is ready to get behind them and, and what are some of the questions that we're looking to answer and how can we bring value and then just working with incredible people and having a, a diverse group of, you know, whether they're scientists, whether they're bankers, whether they're accountants, lawyers, having the right people come around and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, it, you can deliver a lot of value for your shareholders by, uh, if you, if you buy something right. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you kind of started out a little bit in like the investor relations side of the business, which, you know, there's different uh, different colors of that. Uh, it can be a really great experience. It can be a really hard experience, depending on where, where, where you're at. But you've successfully transitioned now to the executive suite, founding company, CEO, running them and sitting on a number of boards. How did you find that transition? Yeah, listen, I, I if I look at my 20 year career, the first 10 years, I would almost describe it as one dimensional, where my job was to communicate with our shareholder base and to potentially grow that base. And so, you know, I look at some of the ways we tried to do that 20 years ago through newspapers, um, through phone calls and through whether it's elevator ads or, you know, all the things that were, you know, uh, banners on highways. Right. I think right. about, you know, <laughs> mail drops when I think about the ways we try to get the word out on a name 20 years ago. And then I look at how we try to do that today. Uh, and 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 so I think the key is marrying the old, the, the relationship building, finding real shareholders that are getting behind a business, but then also marrying it with you know, the digital platforms and the opportunities, whether it's a platform like X or just, you know, some of these uh, highly trafficked web portals where you get a lot of eyeballs. Um, but, but to answer your question about the transition from essentially communications, relationships, however you want to describe that uh, role, investor relations, um, to honing in on you know, looking at project evaluation, you know, really trying to, and, and that's a, a leadership, you know, leading teams, uh, communicating. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a good, it's been a good transition, but I still, you know, I've, I, I've come up as somebody who is servicing my shareholders. And I think that's continuing to serve me well in my roles. And so because I'm, you know, in the case of these mining companies, you know, I'm, I'm not a scientist, um, but, you know, after spending two decades with some of the best scientists in the world, you start learning um, more about how uh, mineralizing systems work and some of the opportunities and also some of the challenges. Hey, excellent. Thanks for giving us a good vantage uh, point to, into, uh, into your experience there. And I think probably uh, after spending 10 years d uh, doing the communications role, that's something I think you're known for today. You continue to do it. And it's highly important to be a really engaging uh, CEO uh, rather than trying to hide from shareholders, even when times are good or bad. Um, so anyways, good job there. Uh, we, we just finished, uh, I guess we're just finishing up sort of a slate of, uh, of investor conferences in Vancouver, uh, Metals Investor Forum, and then getting into VRIC. Uh, and then, and then, uh, and then, and then roundup. Um, what? How did you find uh, sediment? Uh, you're a popular guy. I managed to get a few minutes with you, which was nice to meet you in person for the first time. But how did you find it? What was the sediment like for you? Well, one thing that I've noticed, like again, like looking at the 20 years of experience, um, and if I were to go to a time where we had maximum bullish sentiment, that I would have said that that was around. The spring of 2010. That was maximum bullish sentiment. That's when 50,000 people would show up at a mining conference and uh, you had, you know, 
obscene amounts of capital being raised from generalists and, and elsewhere. So I think where we are today is we've gone from that 2010 peak in bullish sentiment and we found a bottom. And depending on what metric you use to calculate that, that bottom came in either 2015 or 2018, just depending on what metric you use. Like if you look at the gold price, it was 2015. If you look at a statistic like um, brokered equity financings, it was 2018. That was the low. Only $300 million was raised in brokered equity placements versus other times where it's been five or six billion. And so where are we today? Um, well, I started witnessing a change in 2019 where I, I noticed there was a bit of a, a heartbeat, a bit of a drumbeat of new institute, small, but in new institutional players that were coming into the space, mainly actually out of Europe. And that's something that I, you know, we saw we saw generalists leaving the space. We saw institutions and firms blowing up. And from the from the dust, from the carnage, there was a few sprouts that were coming up in 2019. And it wasn't totally evident, but you know, I spend a lot of time on the road, going to different conferences all over, and I started seeing names I'd never seen. And some of these funds actually got their start because they made some money in tech or crypto or other hot sectors, and they were understanding that money cycles from sector to sector, and maybe 2019 was a good time to start looking at commodities, looking at gold, et cetera. And, um, but to, to, to answer your question specifically about this past weekend in Vancouver, I was impressed. You know, I started at the Metals Investor Forum on Friday and Saturday. There was a lot of new faces, a lot of retail investors, a lot of people that were coming out and uh, it was an incredible turnout, particularly considering that the ventures at such a low level and really the industry hasn't given investors a lot back. So I, th I was I was actually quite surprised, particularly because we had a bit a bit of weather here in Vancouver that I thought might keep people away. Um, but no, the, the Metals Investor Forum was well attended and then. You know, Jay Martin put on a phenomenal conference at um, at, at VREC, which was on the Sunday and the Monday. And again, very, very, very well attended. Um, it's a, It was a smaller show, so it was more condensed, less corporates. Um, but I thought it was I thought it was it was a healthy crowd. Um, I can't remember the numbers, but just just sub a thousand, like maybe nine hundred. But um, I thought it was quite uh, quite well attended. And then you've got Roundup, which is more of a technical conference. Um, and again, you know, we, we've had a presence at all three. So all in all, um, sentiment to answer your question. Look, I think that we are in a very tough time. Companies are starved. Capital is starved. People are struggling. You know, um, the industry is boom bust. And there's times when it turns on where there's literally people at the airport handing, whether you're a driller, you know, whether you're a, a geologist, there's, there's, I'm, and I'm not kidding, like they are there with 10, 20, $30,000 signing bonuses to get people. We're at a point right now where there's work, right? There's work. And so there's very few projects that are active. And again, going back to the brokered equity statistic, I think we raised somewhere in the neighborhood of about a billion and a half dollars last year for the space on the broker and equity side. And um, and just to put that into context, 2013 was a really tough year in our business. Really tough year. It was a year that where gold went from 1500 to 1300 and it was coming off that 2010, 2011 high. And we still raised four, excuse me, three times more money a decade ago than we did in 2023. So that's how bad it is right now. It is brutal. It is absolutely brutal. But I think therein lies the opportunity for the investor. Right. Well, hey, that's probably a good segue. Why don't we sort of uh, jump in a little bit more and talk uh, a bit about Dolly Varden, which uh, you guys are fairly active on. 
So maybe you could, uh, would you mind giving us a bit of an overview on, on Dolly Varden? Like, uh, Zoe haven't heard about it. Uh, yeah. like what's the company all about and, and what are you, what are you up to? So Dolly Varden is in a safe mining jurisdiction. You know, we're in the heart of the golden triangle, which is located in, nor in Northwest BC. And the area is famous for some of the biggest, richest gold, silver, and copper mines. And there are two main producing mines in the area that are both controlled by Newmont, so the world's largest gold producer. And again, as an investor, it's important to have majors validate the camp because ultimately, if you're a junior, it's very, very difficult to get the capital required to build a project. It can often take a decade or longer. And you could be facing, depending on the type of project it is, you know, a billion or more in terms of capital expenditures, you know, through investigation, through, you know, development, studies, construction, permitting. And so the nice thing about having Newmont there is if a project is working, Newmont can step in and buy it like they have multiple mines in the area. And so that's positive. Now, outside of Newmont, you have many, many others that are out there trying to reawaken past treasures. And in that list, I would put Dolly Varden at top four or five in terms of emerging project in the district. And, um, and again, we're surrounded by some, some big, big, so that's, you know, I'm very happy with that ranking. But essentially what Dolly Varden is, is we're in the heart of the Golden Triangle. Um, on a silver equivalent basis, we've identified 140 million ounces that are 43101 compliant. So we have 140 million ounces of high grade silver and gold. Um, and uh, essentially, in addition to being in the right location and having a large endowment, what's got the market excited about the company is the drill success. So we've stepped out and we've expanded and extended mineralization. We've made new discoveries. We've made smart acquisitions. The, the, the company in a very depressed environment is up about 300% in the last four years. And it's been up more and it's, but at, you know, total performance. We've, you know, we're up, if you got behind me when I took over four years ago, you're up 300% today. And, and that's at a time where the market cap has grown by 1,000%. And so the company has gone from a $20 million company to a $200 million company. And it's done it on the back of its shareholders. And the shareholders are the best in the world for these types of companies. You've got, we've attracted a corporate. We've attracted Hecla Mining, which is the fastest growing established silver producer in the world and top in North America. So Hecla is a 15% shareholder and actually had made a takeover attempt of the company in the past. Um, in addition to Hecla, you've got uh, large institutional ownership, 47.5%, uh, including Fidelity, which owns 7.5% of the company. And then another notable shareholder is Eric Sprott at 9%. And then there's a corporate, another corporate, that divested a deposit that is a 20% shareholder. So we've got a series of partners and those partners are aligned. And we all really believe that this project has the potential to become an economic deposit. And we are investigating that opportunity right now. And we've identified a lot of high grade endowment. And um, the, the real question is, is there enough silver and gold in the ground to justify the capital expenditures that are going to be required to develop. And I think once we convincingly answer that question, there's an opportunity for the company to potentially be re-rated multiples higher. And that's factoring in like $20 silver, you know, using a three-year trailing price, being really conservative, I believe, and the reason I'm here is I've experienced bull markets, and I think we are in a stealth gold bull market. And it's really not that stealth. It's gold is trading at record highs, 
everywhere. Gold is one of the best performing assets. It's a tier one asset. It is the third most liquid asset in the world. Um, and gold is telling me right now that you want to own it. Central banks are going to it. It's breaking out. And, and for an asset class to break out um, and to go through an old high, and for all the reasons it's doing that, I think it's going to go even higher. And that next move, in my opinion, is, you know, 2,200, 2,400, maybe 3,000 and beyond. And then I've studied silver markets, an experienced one. Silver will lag and then it will outperform. And I've got my hand on 140 million ounces of silver. And they're not in Argentina. They're not in Bolivia. They're not in Peru. They're not in Mexico. It's in BC. It's high grade. And I think this company, um, even if we don't find another ounce, is going a lot higher as this bull market continues in the next leg. Uh, excellent. Uh, well, so perhaps some great leverage uh, to the underlying commodities. Uh, uh, and I managed to get a bit of a chat with some of your geological team at Roundup there the other day, just before I left town. And and uh, they're pretty, I'll tell you, done a good job. They're pretty excited with what they got. Uh, talking about it being a, a, a unique lifetime sort of opportunity, uh, once in a lifetime opportunity to work on something like this. So pretty fantastic. But I was reading, uh, I guess, maybe your last sort of uh, active drilling season, you had like five rigs turning and you're doing something like 55,000 meters of drilling. Did I read that correctly? Yeah, you, you did. So we started with, um, we started with four rigs, uh, three of them turning. And, um, and then we, we, we turned on the fourth and then we picked up a fifth and we went from the initial 40,000 meters that we had planned and we completed 51,500 meters, uh, which was about 115 drill holes. Um, we still have 40 holes that are remaining to be reported, but just to, to give you sort of the highlights, um, there's been two areas on the property. Um, the Wolf Deposit, which is a high-grade silver deposit that a few years ago was a tiny surface high-grade showing that my technical team has now drilled out about a kilometer of strike length. And we're hitting 20 to 30 meters of between three and 400 grams of silver. And it just keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. And, and so the Wolf has been... The Wolf is the reason that Hecla increased their stake in the company by 50%. Um, but what's got me as excited or potentially even more excited is some recent drill results we just put out from home stake silver. So about five kilometers to the north. Uh, so we have two main centers of gravity in terms of endowment. We've got the Torbert Wolf area in the south, which is 99% silver. Then as we move north, we've got a gold silver rich area referred to as home stake. The home stake results, we drilled between 80 and 90 meters of over 350 grams of silver equivalent. And it's half silver, half gold. What's crazy about those numbers here is there's a lot of the silver mines, and I've looked at about 100 silver projects globally. The ones that are high grade, are super narrow, like they're like half a meter, and then you get kilo right. grade. Yeah. And what we have here is we have kilo grades, but over like almost 10 meters. And that's enough for an underground situation that's going to surface. But what's crazy is there's a broader mineralized envelope that's 10 times as thick that's running 12 ounce silver. So what we envision and why I think this is going to become an economic project is you can bulk mine that whole envelope. And, and that makes a lot of sense to me. And then, but it's still early days in that we've got results pending from in between deposits and gap zones. And I just think we're getting started here. Um, and it's an exciting time. And, and the, the technical team's right. Um, these are rare. I've been in the business for 20 years. I've only come around two of these, right? And uh, I was I was joking with my wife that, uh, you know, because she said to me, she's like, oh, you know, I always knew you'd have another one. And I said, well, if I have another one, I hope I don't have to wait another 10 years for it to happen. Like, 
you know, but that's how rare these are. Great. Well, anyways, congrats on that. Uh, so uh, s- sounds like you've got, uh, you were saying some, some uh, other assays pending here, another 40. Uh, what, what's uh, your sort of work season sort of look like uh, for getting back and uh, starting up drills and doing other sort of uh, geological work on the ground? Is it uh, summertime, springtime? What does that sort of look like? Yeah, it's it's spring. Um, so the idea here is to get the assays, interpret them, look at them in the context of all the historic work, and then plan a thoughtful drill program. And so, you know, I'd like to get back up there in the spring. And um, I envision, again, starting with somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40,000 meters uh, you know, maybe 20,000 meters up at that homesake area, 15,000 meters in that Torbert Wolf area, um, and then maybe 5,000 meters of regional exploration. And and just on that front, we're gonna ele- we're gonna introduce a new element to Dolly Varden this year. We've been all silver, all gold, and that's where 95 percent of our focus will continue. But at, at the end of the year, we did this little tuck-in asset where we believe there is a feeder to all this gold and silver mineralization, which we secured. It's a porphyry, and it's a, uh, it's a copper gold porphyry. It's called Big Bulk, and we now have a path to 100% interest for a total consideration of about $1.5 million dollars. So for a million and a half dollars over four years, which is an an incredible deal, um, we will investigate that opportunity this year. And it could be the biggest reward on the the package. But again, we're going to go slow. We're going to be holistic. It's just going to represent 5% of the program. Well, hey, uh, a word I hadn't really heard uh, in a while uh, was copper porphyries. Seem to be pretty popular at the show this year, um, and everybody's sort of uh, trying to pu- pull them out or talk about that they've got one. So uh, good, good for you guys uh, be- being there with something uh, that makes sense for you guys, and and now you know, now you know, good, good opportunity for something else to sort of talk about with shareholders on top of all the uh, existing success you've been having. So that's great to hear. I'll have to look a bit more further into that. Uh, maybe in terms of uh, just kind of summarizing, you've kind of already talked about your cap table and I uh, talked about some of the corporates and great job on that. Uh, phenomenal job. Um, that's really sort of separating, you know, the the that separates, you know, the the have and the have nots, those that are able to get corporate uh, investors to help fund uh, fund these programs. So good. Good on that. Uh, what other sort of future developments uh, can shareholders and potential investors look forward to over the next six to 12 months? Again, I think the reason Dolly has grown in terms of share price and market cap is because, and it goes back to that conversation we had of where I cut my teeth and how I started about, are we accretively growing this company? And our strategy has been when that bull market happens, We want to have as large of a high-grade economic mineral inventory as possible. So essentially, the question is, can Dolly Varden get to two or 300 million ounces of high-grade silver in a safe mining jurisdiction when these projects get three, four, five dollar per ounce valuations in the ground? And when I took over the company, it was trading at 30 cents an ounce in the ground, and we only had 40 million ounces, hence the small market cap. But the larger market cap is reflective of the price of silver starting to catch a bid and the company adding 100 million ounces of silver to the mineral inventory. So in terms of catalysts, how do I continue to grow that mineral inventory? And one way to do that is through organic growth, through drilling, which we're successfully adding ounces with these drill programs. And the other way to do that is through mergers and acquisitions. We've done two acquisitions since I've taken over, um, but it's continuing to de-risk and de-risking this asset goes beyond adding ounces. It's doing things that we don't advertise or celebrate, which are things like getting a road permit. 
tying up um, the surface rates at tidewater, studying at you know studying what it would look like to um, improve roads, extend power lines, some of the economic work in terms of the desktop studies, um, you know, and, and looking and we've been very, and, you know, often what you need to do here, I think, is be creative, whether it's an acquisition, whether it's with a geological model, or whether it's with a production scenario. And so it's that creativity and innovation that leads to incredible growth for shareholders and like we've signed mous with the nishka who are the um first nations group that we are operating in their traditional territories we've signed that mou with um new molly that owns a fully permitted mine site just south of the property and we've we've studied what it would look like to transport our high grade ore versus building our own facility. And so it's in that type of creativity that you can unlock a tremendous amount of value. Like one of the things that you have to appreciate is in this part of the world, if you look at the history, it was hub and spoke. And so going back to what's worked in the past is I think how we're going to be successful. Um, so no, there's, there's a lot of things that are working here in this company and when you have a larger platform and when you have treasury and when you have supportive shareholders and you have the institutions, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And um, and we're keen on seeing how far we can take this company and working very hard to do so. Yeah, excellent. When I first uh, started uh, in the business, which probably was around the same time as you, uh, the magic number of your gold was if you had a million ounces, you're probably going to get acquired. And silver, it was about 100 million ounces. You probably get acquired. What do you think those? Uh, what do you think those sort of uh, numbers need to look like today to get uh, to get a, a major or or a corporate or somebody excited to want to want to buy somebody out? What do those numbers kind of look like in your in your mind? Again, just your own opinion. That's a really, really, really good question. And I think that you know when we started in the business. You know, the, the the markets were just starting to take off, right? And it was a time where gold was depressed for so many decades. We went through two decades from the old top. So there was this reactive move by the majors just to gobble up everything and use, you know, like $1,500 gold price assumptions, even though the average was probably $600 as a three-year trailing price. So I think the industry went on a buying spree and it went into debt to do so. As an industry, we went from a billion in debt to 40 billion in debt in that decade. And there was a lot of dilutive reactive acquisitions. And I think what we've gone through here in the last 15 years is the seniors have been reluctant to do the little deals. So what they've done is, you know, we've seen Barrick and Rand Gold come together. You know, you saw Newmont and Gold Corp come together, then Newmont and Newcrest. You've seen Agnico do some big deals with the likes of Yamana and, and, and so, and Kirkland Lake. So I think that we're at a time right now where you really have to ask yourself who your buyer is. So if you've got a tier one asset, you're going to attract a tier one company like Newmont or uh, Barrick. But I think for me, it's, it's a, it's a Heckler like company that, you know, we fit their business model. Right. And that's why they're a 15% shareholder. So it all depends on the grade of your project, the location of your project. But I think, you know, what I'm seeing right now in this market is 2 million ounces, if it's economic, is sort of the threshold of where it becomes interesting. So I think we've, we've doubled the, the inventory requirements. Now, when you talk about 100 million ounces of silver, 100 million ounces of silver at a 80 to 1 silver to gold ratio is, um, you know, if you look at it through a gold equivalent lens, where do you need 
to get your, your silver resource to that same equivalent threshold based on this ratio. And the number is probably about 160. So you need 160 million ounces to get to that same gold threshold. But Kier, what happens if that ratio changes? And we've seen that ratio go to 125 on the extreme high. It took 125 ounces of silver in March of 2020 to get one ounce of gold. But that's that was very, very, very unusual, unprecedented. On average, you know, that ratio is usually 50, 60 to one. We are in off territory here being 80 to one. So that so the silver project goes from 160 down to 150 down to 120, maybe get back down to 100. So I think that number is it's a it's a moving number based on the silver to gold ratio. But I think to answer your question today, all else being equal, I think it's 2 million ounces of gold. I think it's 160 million ounces of silver. Those are the thresholds. And and they've got to be, you've got to have grade and you got to have infrastructure. And, um, and even then, you're not going to attract the big ones. You'll attract the mid-tier. Great. Well, sounds like uh, you guys are right on the cusp in the next 12 to 24 months. It could be pretty interesting. So... I uh, wish you lots of good luck with that. Um, hey, just because uh, you know you're a CEO of uh, you know fast growing um, uh, come on, you know mining exploration company, and you're also sit on a number of boards. Uh, what what do you think about uh, some of this battery technology stuff and sort of green green technologies and and uh, clean clean tech and stuff like that? Um, any anything sort of interesting sort of going on there? Does silver play like a real a real part uh, in that. Um, yeah, that's debatable. Some people think, oh, yes, that's going to provide a uh, big price appreciation in silver, and other people think it's uh, fanatical. What do you think? Listen, I've, I've developed my own style in terms of how I operate in this business. And I remember being at a conference, um, it was the summer of 2022, and nobody wanted gold. You know, gold was everybody wanted the the battery metals and um you know it's my job in order to deliver those returns to shareholders the only way i know how to do it here is to go into the unloved unappreciated low valued asset and wait for it to become relevant and so on the on the on the battery um, metals front look i think that i'm a very boring plain vanilla kind of guy so I, I understand gold, I understand silver, and if I'm going to get a little bit um, exotic, it's copper. And so copper to me is the future. And, um, you know, I think that if you study commodity markets, what it, it looks like the economic data ahead of us tells us we are going into a slow growth time. And in those moments, the base metals, which copper is, they're not, there's not a big bit under them. So what I'm telling you here is if, you know, uh, my friend, Bob Thompson, who's at Raymond James, he talks about the mining clock. You know, where I think we are is we're going into, you know, six or seven o'clock for gold, you know, as we move towards midnight. But, you know, I think gold goes first. Right, because even if we get a recession, even if we get slow growth, gold will, you know, be it, it'll protect us in deflation. It'll protect us in inflation. If if the central banks decide to continue on the path of money printing, then gold will be the quickest to move out of that policy change um, as we go from tightening to potentially easing. So I think, regardless of what happens, gold is my safe haven. And then I think silver will outperform as gold breaks out. But I look out a year or two, and I think copper is probably. And so when do you want to buy copper? You want to buy it today for that. Kind. So I believe in the you know, critical metals, in the battery metals. I believe that we need this stuff. We are going, going through a transition in the world to electrify the world, and it goes be well beyond electric vehicles. This is something that, you know, before, you know, 
Tesla has had really come in and all the big manufacturers were coming out with EVs. This was about electrifying 4 billion people on the planet, right? That don't have that. So there's an electrification trend and we need this stuff, but it's going to take decades, if not a half century. And we need to be, and, and, and so I think you've got to take a long-term view, but I think right now we're about to go into a strong second leg in the gold bull market, which will impact silver. But if you can look out a year or two, I think now is the time to be accumulating copper opportunities. Uh, excellent. Um, well, hey, man, we've uh, spent some pretty good time. Uh, we're up to the 45 minute mark. So maybe we'll, I'll just let you sort of wrap up. Um, uh, maybe uh, I'll ask you this before we do that. Uh, what's a typical day look like for you? You're a, you're a pretty busy guy. I noticed there's a, it seems to be two or three interviews a week with you and, and you're attending a lot of conferences and then there's a lot of work to be done in between. What's a typical day look like in, uh, in your life? So, you know, like, like I get up at 5 a.m. and um, it's it's back to back meetings and uh, and essentially, you know, eight hours of my day is Dolly Varden silver. And, um, and then what I do is I actually, I break and I go to the gym and that helps me clear my mind and uh, clear my thoughts. And then when I come out, out and, and th in, in Vancouver here, the market's open at six 30 and they close at one. Um, and then after I, I finish the gym in the late afternoon, I spend the rest of the afternoon looking at helping if I'm on a board or if I'm an advisor or looking at my portfolio. Um, I work with a very um, well-known and successful mining financier, Frank Justra. And, um, and, and Frank um, is looking to get behind companies. And one of those companies uh, within his, uh, his interest is West Red Lake Gold Mines, which is a company that uh, we, we started that we financed and that we're advancing and um, looking also though to spread our wings beyond into other metals um, as we're starting to get mandates from various, uh, whether they're governments, whether they're institutions, whether they're corporates and uh, trying to bring our entrepreneurial skill set and our, our scientific skill set to identifying uh, financing and advancing projects. And so, you know, we're big interest in silver, gold, and now turning our attention to copper for the future. Hey, excellent. Uh, anything uh, you want to, any final thoughts you want to leave us as we wrap up here? I, I just really think what makes these companies successful is, like I always say, I can transfer wealth from an investor you know, I'm a, I'm a transfer of wealth through, you know, my, my efforts. But, you know, I work with a very, very talented scientist in Rob McLeod, um, who, you know, that's where the wealth is created. It's his team of geologists, uh, engineers like uh, Ryan Waymark, who works within the group. It's, it's one thing for me to be able to bring the capital, um, but it's really the 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 skill set of the science that creates the wealth for investors and i think where you have incredibly great operations and companies is when you value both of those components and you leverage both of those components and most importantly you buy the asset right hey excellent uh well hey sean i really appreciate your time i'll let you get on with the rest of your uh, busy day um yeah, really thank you. And uh, we look forward to staying up to date on uh, the story. Perhaps we'll come back in, an, in another quarter or two. I'd love to. I'd love to talk about our drill results and our new plans and uh, just keep you posted on our, uh, on our uh, operations moving forward. Thank you so much for having me.